What is up, everybody? Joe Everest, the fence expert for the very first ever Joe Everest, the fence expert live Q&A edition. So um, thank you guys for joining us. We've gotten questions from all over the place. We have met, we've pulled them from our previous videos. Uh, we also have a Facebook page. It's facebook.com forward slash the real Joe Everest. And we've taken some questions from there. Uh, we've also asked you guys in our communities tab here on YouTube, what questions you'd like to have answered. And so what we're doing is we're very diligently recording those right now. So uh, with me today is Jeremy, the man behind the camera. He's diligently uh, writing some questions right now that you guys have asked all over the interwebs, I believe is the correct phrase for that. Uh, and then also I'm watching right now your guys' live chat. So if you're here, say hi. Be able to see that and as you guys ask your questions uh, or follow up questions, maybe to questions I answer here, I'll be able to follow up with them as well. So welcome, everybody. All right. So first and foremost, you know, I want to address the the efforts going on in the southern United States. Um, so what we're finding is we have an audience that's kind of worldwide. It's kind of everywhere. So we've got some Euro European viewers, some Asia, some uh, Australia, New Zealand. So which A, that's awesome. Uh, but B, so what I want to talk about real quick is we had uh, Hurricane Laura come through and Tropical Storm uh, Marco come through the southern United States over the last uh, week or so and really, really wreak a lot of destruction. Um, so first and foremost, thoughts and prayers um, with with those that are affected. I mean, I think in today's media climate, unfortunately, um, issues that should be talked about aren't being talked about or they're being talked over by uh, other issues that are also important. But anyway, so I want to give some more time to uh, thinking about the folks that are recovering, uh, trying to recover from those. Um, that's going to lead into a question, you know, a question that I've been getting quite a lot lately, and that is, so we're just recovering from the treated pine shortage. Um, you know, so I, we posted a video on that a few months ago or a couple months ago uh, about the shortage of the treated pine supply. We're starting to recover from that. So we're starting to see uh, treated pine material levels come back somewhat to normal. So if you're at your local Lowe's, Home Depot, Menards, uh, you're going to start seeing items on the shelves again, which is great. Now, the price hasn't necessarily come down. So the price increase are justified. They were justified by saying, well, we've got all this demand. We don't have the supply to, to supply that demand. So the price has to go up. Well, what we're seeing now is the supply is coming back up. Now, demand is still high. Don't get me wrong. But the supply is coming up. But the prices haven't gone down yet. So we're hoping to see that. But so the big question mark, though, is, you know, have the hurricanes, have tropical storms, have they affected the supply? And as of right now, no, because I mean, if you think about it right now, recovery efforts are not even thinking about, you know, fence, they're not thinking about decks, they're not thinking about accessories to houses. They're, they're concerned with, you know, the bigger issues as they should be. So I think we're going to see, you know, effects of the hurricane season typically they're seen in the first and second quarters of the following year as people are starting to rebuild fences rebuild decks that sort of thing so we're starting to see supplies come back up uh, tree to pine now we're starting to see not necessarily shortages but uh, longer delivery schedules of so here in the midwest of the united states we deal mostly in treated pine or cedar when we're talking about fences and cedar supplies, the deliveries are getting a little bit longer just because the demand has gone from treated pine to elsewhere in the market. Cedar here in the Midwest. On the West Coast, you see a lot more redwood. And so from I was talked to a, a dealer of redwood uh, in Northern California who had said that their supply, their deliveries from their manufacturers or from their uh, log mills, lumber mills, that's the word. Uh, their delivery times are getting stretched out. So not necessarily a supply issue. It's more of a delivery issue. Uh, same thing. We do ornamental steel, ornamental aluminum. So delivery times have gone from three to four weeks to more like six to eight weeks. So doubling the delivery times. So it's not necessarily that's not available. It's just taking longer to get to us. So it takes longer to get it to the consumer. Um, I think you're going to, you're going to continue to see that. 
until the treated pine market fully comes back and is fully resupplied, I think you'll see longer delivery times uh, in the other types of fencing. Now, there's one exception. There's kind of a hybrid, I guess you'd say, and that's the vinyl market. So in terms of uh, vinyl materials, six the standard, six foot, privacy, white, nothing crazy, just standard fencing, we're seeing typically the longer lead times to six to eight weeks, a little bit of a price increase uh, that we've seen really across the board, even for cedar, aluminum, and steel. Uh, so vinyl, standard vinyl hasn't been affected any differently than anything else. What we're starting to see, though, is, or what we've seen is the custom order vinyl. So wood grain, tan gray, the, you know, custom styles, the five-foot privacy with a, sh with a foot of lattice on top, uh, that the, the manufacturers aren't even taking those orders. I mean, they'll take them, but they're not giving expected delivery dates. So uh, vinyl's kind of a little bit of a hybrid in that as long as it's a standard style, you can pick it up pretty easily. But if it's anything custom, they're not even taking the order. Or if, the, or if they do take the order, they're not giving an estimated delivery. All right. So we've got someone with us here. So ZL, I'm going to butcher this. ZL Spiel 05 um, says he's there in Houston starting to see treated pine materials. Yep. Wondering about the quality of things being pushed out right now. So that's going to be a really good question. And that's something we touched on a little bit uh, on the video about treated pine shortage in that number, number one treated pine it is, you know, unheard of to find, especially in a lumber store. Uh, I still haven't seen much treat, not much number one treated pine come through. The bulk of it's going to be number two. Um, it, it depends on the mill, right? So most of them call it number two, some call it number two better, um, yeah, the quality I haven't the quality of what's out there is is on the low end. Uh, you're seeing what I'm afraid of is you're seeing a lot younger pine come out. So these mills are cranking this this treated pine product out as fast as they can, which we've been seeing that over the last five to seven years. Right. We've been seeing younger and younger uh, trees being used. But right now, I really think. I really think these mills are pushing the product out as fast as they can to try to supply the demand. Uh, but I think you're right. I think the quality is suffering because of that. Uh, Will's with us. Will, how are you, buddy? It's good to see you here. Um, all right, we'll follow up. So let's see. Some pine fences I've put up recently have had a bunch of warpage and shrinkage. Yeah, so I think that's getting back to the, the younger wood being used and that the – quality control process on the products isn't the best if it's there right now, just because they're so focused on getting product out the door. So tree to pine in general, in general sees that in general, it sees the shrinkage and the warpage. So we somewhat expect that. Right. But what I'm thinking is these boards go out so quickly, the treatment's still wet when it arrives at the end, at the end user at the, or at the low, some depot Menards, the lumber yard that it's not done drying. It's certainly not done curing. So that process is happening while it's in the customer's yard. And that's when you see warpage and shrinkage is just as that board dries. So let's get nerdy for a second and talk about why wood warps and twists. So, and understand, I'm not a scientist, I'm a fence guy, right? Let's set that standard right now. But what I learned from my grandfather is that so the reason wood warps is one side dries before the other side and they're not able to, not, there's no equilibrium there. So it always pulls to the dry side. So it's like a sponge, right? You never see, I guess you hardly see a flat dry sponge. It's always curled. And that's because the dry side pulls that, it pulls it, it constricts and it pulls that sponge to the other side. Well, it does it on the wood the same way. The dry side of the picket dries first and it starts pulling that board over time towards the dry side. Now this usually isn't immediate, right? So you usually don't see it in the first week of the fence going up because that fence is still drying, it's still curing. Well, but then it's gonna rain, it's gonna become dry again, and it's rain and dry and rain and dry. So this process repeats over the course of a year to two years. And that's when you really start seeing a lot of warping and twisting, especially in the tops of the pickets. You see that a lot where you look down a line of fence, instead of it being you know a straight line, you start seeing those Tops of this picket really kick out either way, just because they dried unevenly. So, yeah, to answer your question or, or your follow up there, yeah, you're starting to see a lot more warpage and twisting because these boards are soaking wet when they go up. And as they dry, they're not drying evenly. All right, let's pick up 
Uh, sorry, Will. What? Yeah, was going to getting hard to come by here in Dallas. It's jacking up the price of new build construction. Is this also going to raise the price of fence? Absolutely. So we saw that almost immediately. So the same phone conversation from our whole the wholesaler we deal with for Treated Pine said, "A, I don't have any number one. I'm running out of number two. And hey, also the price has gone up thirty percent." same conversation. I don't have it. And your price is, is more expensive for what I do have. So what you're seeing is the number two, which is lower quality in some cases is actually priced more than number one used to be. So it's going to affect prices, not only for fence, not only for decks, but for home construction as the price of material increases. I mean, the price has to go somewhere. The contractor can only absorb so much of it. So yeah, unfortunately it's going to affect anything with lumber. Um, and like I said, so the supply is coming back. You're starting to see these materials up on shelves, but the price the price hasn't come down any. The price is still the same. You're still seeing, you know, in our area, so say a four by four by eight uh, pressure treated pine post, what used to be seven, eight, nine dollars is now fifteen, sixteen dollars, and uh, the price hasn't come down any. So I'd be interested to see as the supply comes up, does the price go back down? I have a feeling we all we all have a sneaky suspicion the price isn't going to go down as much as it went up. It never seems to equalize again. All right. So Durf Boy 06, I'm upset with companies taking online orders and holding them. Lowe's has 12 pallets on hold for about three weeks. Customers haven't picked them up or paid, but technically they're on hold. So that's, so we saw a lot of this in the weeks after the big announcement that treated pine was going to be in a shortage is you saw companies go and buy truckloads of lumber, not necessarily pick them up, just bought them and then had them set at the wholesaler or at low Home Depot Menards because technically they own them. They bought them, but they, they haven't taken possession of them because they don't have anywhere to store it. And, and I absolutely understand your frustration. You know, I've been in these stores trying to source materials for projects that we're under contract for, and seeing you know, pallets and pallets and pallets of lumber, you say, what about that one? I'll take that one. No, not for sale. That one's already spoken for. What? Yeah, it was bought a couple of weeks ago. They just haven't picked it up yet. Incredibly frustrating. But, you know, how do you combat that? You know, do you require pickup? Do you require pickup? All right, so maybe you do. Well, what's the time frame? Do they have to pick it up right when they buy it? Well, that's not really practical on online orders. I think it's it's a slippery slope to to try to regulate people buying online and then not picking them up immediately. But I don't, I, I think you're right though. It's really frustrating. So maybe there does need to be a pickup window of, and I don't know what it would be, but maybe it's a week, maybe it's two weeks, but I feel your frustration for sure. All right. So I think we're pretty up to date here. Let's talk about, let's, so questions that Jeremy has found either on YouTube videos, our Facebook group, our YouTube community group here. Um, so Anthony asked, are you going to make a string layout slash level video? Uh, absolutely, Anthony. So in what Anthony's referring to is probably on one of our videos on laying it, how to lay out a fence or mistakes that fence contractors or DIY group too, uh, the mistakes you see on their fences. And so we talk about using a string line instead of an eyeball on say, you know, installing your fence posts. Now understand I've done it both ways. When I grew up growing up in the company, my granddad used to eyeball fence and he had a couple set guys that, I mean, their eyeballs were sharp. They could really set a good post. Uh, unfortunately, that's not really trainable to have that eye. So we went to using more of a string line approach because as long as the wind isn't just really crazy, the string won't lie. The string will tell you exactly where that line needs to be. Um, so we use string. Yes. To answer your, question anthony we will be doing a video we're planning on planning on doing another video uh, on layout methods as far as as far as layout methods but also so we did a video a little while ago also talking about how to install fence on slope terrain right on stair stepping versus contouring with the ground and and i and i heard your feedback on that video guys in that uh, there's a lot of frustration that wasn't done on site so we're going to remake a video that a shows using a string line, uh, both with the layout of the fence, but also in, when we're installing the, you know, say installing the rails, installing the pickets, that sort of thing, uh, how a string line might come into play in those installations, but also the, the property that we've picked out for this installation also has a fair amount of slope. So we'll be able to show you that as well, how we contour the fence on the slope rather than using the stair stepping method. 
Uh, we're also going to be reviewing a few different uh, manufacturers of foam. That was a big feedback we heard on the foam video is that, so we use one brand of foam, the Sika brand, um, per their instructions, per the videos that they had also on, on YouTube, on their page on YouTube, and it just really didn't work well. I mean, if you guys saw the video, you know, we saw some um, shrinkage there. The post just really wasn't, really didn't stay solid in the ground. So anyway, we're going to, the piece of feedback we heard both from commenters and also from other manufacturers of the foam is that we should have used different brands. So uh, of course, especially from the manufacturers, their brand is the best brand. Everyone believes theirs is the best, but also some customers have had really good success with other brands. Uh, we're going to incorporate that into those series of videos as well. Um, so yeah, to answer your question, Anthony, yes, we will be making a video about using string for layout uh, and, also on leveling a fence on or use contouring a fence on unlevel terrain. All right. Eric had a question. Uh, he's currently building a privacy fence, but he was using auger, but is useless on Rocky ground. Eric, I can feel your pain. Absolutely. Uh, sometimes augers just don't work. Right. So we've got dirt bits for augers. We also have, rock bits for our augers. Um, so they're more of a chewing teeth than say a digging tooth. Um, but sometimes that rock is there. You know, I saw a comment in one of our videos, the comment came in this morning. I'm talking about, uh, I believe they were in the Texas area. I'd had to go back and check, but basically just said, Hey, we're on solid granite. Uh, you're not going to dig anywhere around here and find dirt. It's all rock. And in those cases, so you've got a couple options, right? And the, the really the most successful one is you core drill into the rock and set to the rock. And if it's done correctly, that post will be the strongest post of the entire fence because now to get that fence post to move, you have to move that entire piece of rock, whether it's a boulder or a slab of granite, whatever it is. Um, or you, so if you're using a steel post and you can't say the post is too big, you could always plate the post, anchor it to the rock using uh, masonry anchors. But the, our preferred method is to drill into the rock and, and set the post directly. Now, that's not going to be really useful if you're using wood post, right? So the wood post is typically four by four. Uh, a lot of guys will use, if they're still using wood posts on gates, they'll use a six by six or four by six. So that means you would have to have like an eight inch hole uh, directly bored into the rock and that's not feasible. And so even on the projects, now we've moved moved away from using wood posts completely, mainly due to the shortage. Uh, we use steel posts exclusively now. But if we were to, if this was in the past and we came upon a project that was nothing but solid rock and it was sold with wood posts, we'd have to have a conversation with the customer and just say, "Hey, this is what we're seeing. We, here's some rocks that we've exposed. It's solid, and we're not moving it. We can't. Our trucks roll with jackhammers and breakers, right? So we've tried that and it didn't work." we're going to have to talk about using steel posts because if we use steel posts so we can core drill directly into the rock, grout it in again, that post will be the strongest post on the entire fence. But long winded answer, Eric, to say, I feel your pain. Sometimes augers don't work. You know, even in, even in the best conditions, sometimes they really struggle. So if you're using a dirt bit on the auger, you could try uh, a lot of rental yards will have uh, bits exclusively for rock, rock bit augers, Especially if you're, if you're in a rocky area, this is not the first time somebody's trying to drill a hole. A lot of times the rental yards will have those. Try it out. Um, typically, I think rental is something like 30, 40 bucks a day on a good rock bed auger. And uh, give it a try before you buy it. And those augers are expensive, but if nothing else, you'll have to core drill and uh, set to it. All right. Let's see. We're still caught up on the online chat. So, on to Alan's question tips on digging out existing concrete. And large stones. All right. So, okay. So that's kind of similar to Eric is Eric's, you know, augers useless on rocky ground. Um, so we have, we have jack hammers on the trucks. We use electric jack hammers. Um, if it's really crazy, if the concrete's really tough. So if it's a, say if it's a commercial installation and they've set to high density concrete, sometimes we'll go get an air driven um, air chisel to try to chisel that out. There's no good way of doing it, Alan, as far as, you know, there's no really hot tips on, on digging out existing concrete. So one thing we'll do, one tip I'll give you, I guess, is that, so if we're digging out fence posts, and we actually had a video on this uh, video review, I think that was our last video, it was last week's episode was 
uh, reviewing a, a guy who had a no dig way of removing a fence post. And it's a, it's a technique that we use when we can uh, using a jack to jack out a post. But what happens if that post snaps right level with the ground or right level with the concrete, you can't get a good bite on it. What we've had success with is so using that same jack and chain, uh, drilling in a concrete, a masonry anchor bolt into that concrete, bolting the chain onto the masonry anchor using the jack or hopefully guys, hopefully you've got a mini skid in the yard, right? That, so that was a, one of the most common pieces of feedback on the jack method of removal is, well, why don't you just bring in an auger? Why don't you just bring in a skid loader or a mini skid? Why don't you bring your piece of equipment in and just yank it out? I hear you. Usually we do. But if you've built fence for any length of time, you know sometimes there's yards that that just isn't an option. For whatever reason, that piece of equipment is not getting on that post. Um, so then we use a jack, right? But anyway, so masonry anchor into the large boulder, into the plug of concrete, whatever. Uh, masonry, then you bolt the chain to it. The chain goes to your jack or hopefully your piece of equipment. Try to pull it out that way. Of course, you can always try to dig around it, dig under it, try to loosen as much dirt around it that's got uh, got a hold on it, loosen up a little bit, pull it out that way. Um, yeah, so, but but that's the only tip I got for you. It There's no good answer to rocks. Rocks are large pieces of concrete. All right. So, what is up, Roger? Okay. So, Roger's, Roger's got a good question. Is it beneficial to join AFA? Short answer, yes. I, I enjoy the AFA. I think it's great to have a, a like-minded group of individuals that do what you do so you can bounce ideas off of it, off of them. So AFA also once a year has Fence Tech, where it's the annual uh, annual show, annual chance to meet a large amount of the vendors in one place, see what new products they have, talk to them about their existing products. But AFA also has quite a lot of edu educational content available, uh, educational opportunities during Fence Tech. Uh, when I was a kid, you know, growing up, that was the one chance, one part of the year where you could really hone in on your education, really improve your education in regards to building fence and fence related issues. Uh, one thing AFA has done, and unfortunately, it's just prior to the COVID and Corona was they started doing on the road education. So doing it by region so that maybe they didn't have education once a year, maybe you had educational opportunities, depending on where you lived in the country, two, three, four times a year to where you could work on, you know, either your accredited uh, fence contractor or your fence professional certification designation um, right now. And you'd have to, I don't, I'm not a part of the national AFA. I, I'm not know exactly what their plans are, but I, what I've heard is, so they're working on digital education. So a lot of that training can be done online, uh, which is really keeping with the times, right? So is it beneficial to join AFA? Absolutely. Um, if nothing else, then you have a group of individuals, guys and gals that are fencing professionals that you can bounce ideas off of. Uh, of course, the national convention, the fence tech every year is always a good time. You get to meet with other fencing professionals in one place face to face, but also uh, see the vendors. And it's a great time to get all your education in. And this also, you know, if you've gotten your education in, but you haven't got your testing for the certification, they typically have all the testing uh, you need scheduled. So you can sign up and, uh, Get your testing done for your certification. So short answer, yes. AFA is absolutely beneficial. Uh, then Roger goes on to say, hey, everyone, don't forget to hit the thumbs up. Absolutely. If you find this content helpful, if you find it entertaining, educational, if you like it in any way, shape, or form, it would mean the world to us if you gave it a like. It lets YouTube know that uh, we're doing something right here. Uh, also, go ahead and... Uh, Share it. If you find it educational, if you find it helpful, sharing it always helps uh, get us in front of people that you know that are also interested in fencing related topics. Uh, if you're new to the if you're new to the if you're new to the channel, go ahead and hit the subscribe. And if you do hit the bell, ring the notification bell so that YouTube lets you know as we have new content uh, that gets uploaded every week. Um, yeah, it all means the world to us. It all makes this thing go around. And I really appreciate it. All right. Let's see. So I'm going to answer this one just for the name. Let me read real quick. <laughs> awesome Waffle. What a great name. Tips for building a fence in Arizona. Tough, hard clay, dirt, rock, dirt and rock tips. 
So this kind of relates to the other two, right? So if you're in, if you're in, you know, the farther west you go, you get a lot more clay, you get a lot more compacted soil. Now we get a lot here in Missouri too, but yeah, you're going to want an auger bit specifically made for harder terrain, right? So you can get dirt or rock augers. Uh, there are two different types of tips or two different types of uh, teeth on the end of those augers uh, that do that do either uh, digging or grinding, chewing for rocks. Now it takes longer. You got to let it work away that rock and try to get under it to get the rock up. But uh, you could absolutely buy uh, rock auger tips. And so one thing we use those for too. So a question we get uh, we get a lot is and I don't see it up on the board, but winter. Right. What happens when the ground's frozen? How do you build fence in the winter when the ground's hard? Well, luckily here in the Missouri, here in Missouri, when we're talking about actual frozen ground, it doesn't go down that deep. Now, there are exceptions. We do get hard winters occasionally, but luckily lately we haven't had a really hard winter in quite a while. So what we would do is we trade out our dirt, dirt augers for rock augers and let the rock auger just chew away at the frozen dirt until we get down to good diggable soil and then trade it out for the dirt auger and continue to hold down. So rock tips or rock augers can be used all year round, uh, even on frozen dirt. So maybe that's a tip for you from us. All right. Let's see. Quick technical question. What size of framing nails do y'all use to attach two by four rails to wood posts? I can only find three and a quarter inch galvanized ring shank for my nailer. Yeah. Uh, three and a quarter. So, all right, let's talk this through. Three and a quarter is going to be probably a bit long. So uh, a two by four is only actually going to be an inch and a half wide, right? So it's two by four nominal, actually inch and a half by three and a half. Now I get it. You can find true to measure two by four somewhere. Someone has them fine. But the majority of what you see is inch and a half by three and a half. So you have an inch and a half of two by four. And then you have a one inch picket, which again, one inch nominal, three quarter is being a bit gracious. A lot of pickets you see in the market are actually going to be half inch. So if you have a you know inch and a half on your two by four and you have half an inch, really you're only going to have two inches of material to nail into. So if we're at if we're at two inches, so you know, let me answer this question. When I get back to the office, I'll pull up a pack of our nails. But last I checked, we we're using inch and a half. Uh, that way, even if the nail countersinks through the picket a little bit, you're still not going to have spiked edges coming out on the other side of that uh, of that two before. Great question. So again, like I said, I'll answer that in the comments below when we get back to the office. As far as we had this question come up, I'm not sure if I answered it previously as far as the diameter of the nails too so basically what i'll do guys um is i'll i'll see if there's a link to the nail if not i'll just give you guys the brand the length the diameter of the uh of the galvanized ring shake nails we use for finishing jb asks where can i go to get pre-stained pickets for board on board uh jb is really going to be it's probably going to be regionally dependent um, so as a fence contractor, we sell pre-stained boards, but not all fence contractors do. We happen to have the equipment to do the pre-staining of the pickets in-house. Uh, there's a lot of suppliers, uh, Master Halco being one that sells a pre-stained uh, fence picket, but from what they sell it in our region, but in talking with other fencing contractors in other regions, I don't know that they sell those nationwide. Uh, you'd want to, you'd want to follow up with, so a lot of the fencing contractors will also sell material. So we have a retail division also. Uh, you'd want to reach out to a fence company that also sells retail and to see, A, if they carry them, and B, if they don't carry them in stock, can they order them, um, you know, through a Master Halco? I don't, I don't know. Well, Master Halco is one that I know carries them uh, regionally. That being said, I was in Menards last week, the week before, our local Menards, and uh, they actually had a pre-stained uh, picket there as well. So... Now it's going to be more expensive. I have a feeling than you know a fence company that has a retail that can buy directly from Master Halco, uh, but you never know. So that would be my two my two places. First, start with a fencing contractor. Um, you know, I don't know how to say this delicately. Typically, you'd find better quality material at a fencing contractor because they're selling fencing material that they install. Um, the quality that you would find at a lumberyard might not be the same quality that you'd find at a fencing contractor but it would also be a, 
another resource for you. Why don't people pressure treat cedar? Ask Miles. Great question, Miles. So why do we pressure treat? Why do we pressure treat pine? And that's to prevent and delay rot, decay, uh, insect infestations from this wood for as long as possible. That's that's the end goal. So the reason we don't pressure treat cedar prior to installation is because the natural cedar oils naturally resist rot, insects, and decay. Uh, now, does it do it indefinitely? No. But let's also talk about the pressure treated pine also doesn't last indefinitely either. So we're talking about delaying it for as long as possible. Luckily, like I said, the oils in cedar resist rot and decay. Typically, you know, when we were installing wood posts, when we would install a cedar post, we'd give it a lifespan of 15 to 20 years. Now the board is eventually going to dry out. The post is going to dry out. The cedar oils are going to dry. And so not necessarily give it their preserved qualities. But uh, a basic answer to your question would be that cedar already comes naturally preserved against rotten insects and decay. Now, that being said, we do, we do pre-stain cedar material. So even though the cedar oil is preventing rot, insects, and decay, it doesn't prevent the, you know, the graying of the board. It doesn't prevent UV damage. So what we do is we take it a step further and we will pre-stain, pre-seal a cedar picket, cedar rail uh, installed on a steel post. We'll, all the wood products will pre-stain them. Uh, we prefer stain and seal experts product. Uh, that group, they use, they provide a really nice oil-based stain. Uh, they're out in Nashville. Uh, so we'll pre-stain it. That way it's preventing it from UV damage. UV damage is visible by the board grain. So that's the visible uh, evidence of UD, UV damage. Now, if we were to take, say, a pressure washer and strip off a layer of that, we would see good wood again. Because UV damage typically sits on the surface. It only goes a layer too deep. What we do is we pre-stain the board. We use an oil base because it's penetrating, means it goes throughout the board. Uh, you see some water-based stains that are surface stains. Uh, but anyway, what we're doing is we're more preventing UV damage. So if your main concern is rot and decay, the cedar material doesn't need to be pre-stained because the oil in it naturally prevents rot and decay. But if you're concerned with UV damage as visible by the board grain, you'd want to pre-stain it with, uh, we prefer, like I said, a penetrating oil-based sealant. I hope that answered your question. If not, leave me a follow-up question and I'll be sure to answer it. All right. Let's see. Okay. So JB lives uh, in Washington state. So yeah, JB, you'd want to check, like I said, check with a fencing contractor. I know master Halco has distribution throughout the United States. Um, you'd want to check with a fencing contractor. You could actually probably reach out to master Halco directly and ask them, uh, in your market, who, which one of their fencing contractors also sells retail, they usually have a pretty good idea who's also selling fence material. Um, and, and be specific. This is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a pre-stained uh, wood picket. Uh, who can I buy that? I know you guys sell that, at least uh, maybe not regionally, but you have access to it in, say, a distribution center. Who can I buy that product from? And I'm sure they'll have uh, at least a couple guys that, can, that you can reach out to. All right. I think we're caught up here. Let me just kind of scroll through these comments. Like I said, guys, if you have a follow-up question, leave it in the comments below. I'm going to keep an eye on that. All right. So let's go back to our board here. So Daryl's got a good question. How do I keep a dog from digging under my fence? Ugh. So it depends on the type of fence, right? And well, so there's several ways. One way is, you know, the way I've seen in the past is, so say if if it's a chain link fence, it's galvanized, so it's going to prevent rusting. Uh, you could bury a, a portion of that fence below grade. Uh, we've replaced a lot of that. Let me tell you, it will keep a dog from digging under it, but the guys that were replacing that fence will absolutely not enjoy their life while they're trying to dig that out of the ground. Uh, but the dogs also don't dig out. But if you have, say, a wood fence where you wouldn't want to bury that material, uh, vinyl, uh, you could probably bury a vinyl fence. I mean, it's not going to rot. But uh, what one way I've seen is also a concrete trench. And so uh, who was I watching? I was watching YouTube videos, some guys down in, uh, down in Texas. I'll have to link them in the comments when I get back to the office, but uh, they, they had a, a two foot trench dug. Right. And then they drilled their fence holes through that trench, installed their post, And so that way they, when they poured the concrete for the post, they just brought in a concrete ready mix truck and filled the whole trench that way. 
Uh, they had a trench. I think the trench was uh, 12 or 16 inches deep. And then, of course, the post down there, I think the post they were doing were 30 inches deep. Uh, but so you have a physical barrier that keeps the dogs from digging under it. Um, so, again, the two options would be either bury a piece of chain link to where they can't can't dig past it or a concrete trench. Uh, neither one of those are very fun. I mean, the chain link is probably going to be your easier option. Uh, your concrete is going to be your most durable and long term option. All right. Uh, so Miles has a follow up question. So what do you think lasts longer, pressure treated posts or cedar posts? I'm in Washington State and we use pressure treated posts almost exclusively here. So, Miles, let's talk about for a second that I'm not a scientist. I'm a fence guy. I built fence for three generations. I know fence. I don't know science. From what I've gathered in comments when we're talking about rotting post, the acidity in the soil, the pH of the soil has a lot to do with it. My experience is here in Missouri, here in the Midwest. Our soil is probably likely different than yours when we're talking about pH and acidity. For us, cedar lasts a lot longer than a pressure-treated pine does. You know, so a cedar post, like I said, when we're installing them, we give them a lifespan of 15, 20 years. They, they last quite a bit longer. A pressure-treated post, honestly, realistically, is probably closer to 10 years. With a newer post, we're, we're replacing posts here in a couple of weeks. We went and looked at a project last week. Uh, the pressure-treated pine post, they had the receipts where they paid a fencing contractor four years ago to install it. The posts are already rotting. So... Now, that could also talk to, like I said, the age of the material, the level of pressure treated. There's a lot of variables that go into this, but in our soil, cedar lasts longer than pressure treated. Um, but if we're talking about longevity, I think we should talk about the fact that we should get away as an industry, get away from using wood post at all. You know, if we're talking about wood posts, a four by four by eight costing, you know, here in the Midwest, $16, $18. There's not that much financial difference, financial upgrade to upgrade to a steel post. To the postmaster is the post we use. It just seems to be the most broadly used in the fencing industry. Uh, I mean, there's uh, there's another fence, the lifetime fence or lifetime post. Uh, there's a few more manufacturers that make a postmaster type post. Um, but I think as an industry, we should really talk about the fact that we need to get away from using wood posts at all. Once you put one of these steel posts that's galvanized, you know, warranted against rust and corrosion, once you put it in the ground, I mean, barring a car driving through this fence, barring an asteroid falling on the thing, we're not going to have to replace that post again. It's done. You know, we're not dealing with rot. We're not dealing with decay, insects, we're not dealing with warping or twisting. The post is done. So, you know, in 20, 30 years, when we're replacing the materials on this fence, now we don't have to replace the fence post anymore. I've replaced a lot of fence posts and I look forward to the day where we don't have to replace posts again. Um, I don't know. That was kind of like a, a, a round the way answer to your question here in the Midwest cedar posts last longer than pressure treated. All right. So another technical question for cedar pickets, where is a good place to buy ring shank stainless steel nails or polymer coated nails? Okay. So great question. We, we use a, you know, a, a nail distributor. Uh, I think they're more of a regional distributor. I don't know that you guys have them in Washington state. You know, you could start with someone like a fast nail. Um, do a fast, do a fast distributes nails. We don't use do a fast nails because for us, the nail guns haven't been uh, incredibly reliable and the service center here hasn't been incredibly timely. So we got away from using do a fast altogether, but uh, I believe do a fast does sell it. Do they do sell stainless steel ring shank nails? Um, you can try with a fastenal. Really, really, what you want to find is a fasteners wholesaler, a fasteners distributor. Now they'll do everything from lags to lag bolts to carriage bolts to uh, you know screws to nails. They'll have a little bit of everything and reach out to two or three of them. Say, hey, this is what I'm, this is specifically what I'm looking for. Do you carry it? Do you know who does carry it? Uh, you're probably not going to find them in the big box stores. Yeah, they might be able to order them, but I would have to think the pricing would would probably reflect that. You'd be better served finding a you know fastener distributor. Um, Fastenal seems to be state you know United coast to coast in the United States, um, but find a regional fastener distributor and start there. That's that's what I would do. That's what we do. All right, so. Roger says, "Hey Joe, I may email you with some super top secret questions." 
I know you're busy, so answer when you get the time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you can always send me send me your questions. Send me your, uh, you know, if you've got feedback for me, uh, send it over to me. So I'll give you guys my email address. It's joe at oz, that's Oscar Zebra, fence.com. Joe at ozfence.com. Send those straight to me. Uh, we're starting to get some emails to our company email address, which is just info at ozfence. And while that's fine, it does take a little bit for those to work their way to me. Um, I'm not the first first stop in that email chain. Uh, if you got a question, email it to me directly. But you know, like Roger said, I might not email, I might not get back to them just straight away. I do answer my emails, but sometimes it takes a while. Similar to YouTube comments. Uh, I answer YouTube comments as I can, when I can, um, but we all live busy lives, right? So usually I end up answering them in the evenings, and my wife is not a huge fan of that. Uh, so I answer them when I can. All right. So, but yeah, send me your super top secret questions. I'll be happy to answer them. But to be fair, I might also bring them up in a video. Here's the thing. So super top secret here. When my granddad and dad were fencing, there was always this idea that my ideas are my ideas and my tricks and secrets were mine and I'm not sharing them with anybody. Right. And I think as an industry, again, we need to get away from that too. I mean, that's the whole idea of this channel right, is to share knowledge, to try to pass along tips and tricks, shortcuts to not, and shortcuts, is, I think it's a term that has a negative connotation. What we're trying to do is be the most efficient fencing contractors we can be while providing a quality, you know, quality good. That is our end goal is quality has to be the standard, right? High quality has to be our standard we hold ourselves to, but can we do it more quickly and more efficiently? Can we find materials that are a little bit higher quality and that can be installed efficiently? If so, let's share it. Um, yeah. So email me your super top secret question. I'd be happy to get back to it when I can, but fair notice, you know, if it's a really good tamper trick, I'll probably share it on here. So keep that in mind. All right. Uh, let's see. I'm going to butcher this name. Chuppy Chups. Maybe. I don't know. I live in Miami, Florida. We're more susceptible to tropical storms and hurricanes, as we're seeing. Uh, which post do you recommend? Round post or double up Master Halco? <clears throat> so I, of those two choices, the doubled up Master Halco. Uh, steel post, so round steel post, you can get into Schedule 20, Schedule 40. Neither one of those are probably going to be a great option. I mean, they sell heavier round posts. I would double up on the Postmaster post. I mean, they're wind load rated. So a single post is wind load rated to 72 miles an hour. But we're talking about hurricanes, tropical storms, gale force winds. I mean, we're talking about winds that exceed 72 miles an hour, you know, sometimes by a large margin, large margin. So, you know, I would double, I would double up a master Halco post. So, but your, your trick there, right, is going to be how to cover them. So you're going to have to have a plan for how to cover those. Uh, or maybe not. Maybe your customer is totally cool seeing them. If so, that would be a lot easier, but um, but have a plan for how you're going to cover up the back side of that doubled up Master Alco post. Uh, but yeah, if those are my two choices, that's the one I go with. All right. All right. Well, Roger has good feedback. What you just shared is what I believe your channel will grow exponentially, brother. Roger, I appreciate it. And I appreciate you guys. I appreciate guys and gals like you uh, that ask, ask questions and give me the opportunity to just explain my thoughts and, and try to pass on this knowledge. Right. So I think we all, I think we're all guilty of this in one way or another in that, you know, we have blinders on, I can see what I can see and what I, what I don't see, what I don't think about just get, sits on the back burner. And sometimes it takes someone asking a question similar to yours to where it brings it back to the forefront. Oh yeah. Inside my blind spot or outside my blind spot, puts it in my vision and, and gives me an opportunity to answer the question for you. So Roger, thank you. And for everyone that asks questions, I appreciate it because it gives me a chance to answer them for everyone else. All right, let's see. I'll uh, answer Daryl's question. All right, so guys, so Tom has a question. What happens if you encounter a large rock? There's a theme here. There's a recurring theme to these questions. Tom, it's the same answer. So whether it's a large rock or it's a boat or a slab, Insert hard object, concrete, whatever. Core drill through it if you can. 
you know, that's obviously if you can set your post to whatever this large inanimate object is that will not move, that'll be the strongest post of the whole fence. Core drill it, set it to it. Now, like I say, you're probably going to have to switch to a steel post. A wood post is just by nature going to be larger and that's going to take a larger hole, which is going to take longer to try to core drill through that. But, um, Okay, so here's a probably good follow up is where do you get so if you're if you're just starting out in the fencing contracting if you have if you don't have the tools to core drill what where do you go? Um, so we don't have every core bit made demand. Sometimes we need a larger core bit, or occasionally in in a custom or certain scenario we don't have a small enough core bit. So the core bits we have would just be simply too large for the project. Uh, really any supply, any rental yard, a contractor rental yard is going to have a pretty wide selection of bits. Uh, maybe not maybe not the one you use all the time. But there will be one typically in your area that's going to have a pretty good selection of uh, core bits. And that's exactly what you – and explain what you're doing. Hey, I need to drill a hole in something really hard. It's a rock or it's concrete. Uh, what do you have that can help me accomplish that? I'm probably going to have a rotary hammer drill. So that's going to – one, spin the bit, but it's also, while it's spinning, hammering to try to get that bit further down into the rock or the concrete or whatever. Uh, so a rotary hammer drill and a uh, and a core bit, a core drill bit. So uh, any supply yard ought to be able to have that for you. Uh, if the one that you go to doesn't, call around. One of them will, I'm fairly certain. The one, so we're in a, we're in a smaller city in Missouri. So we're based out of Springfield, Missouri. Uh, and we have... I mean, three supply, three rental companies, I can think of the top of my head. The main one is the one we use, but there's sometimes, I mean, sometimes all the bits are rented, right? Sometimes they're gone they don't have any more. So even in our smaller city, we've got three options I can go to. And typically one of them will have a bit. All right. Jimbo, what's your favorite one or two man auger brand? So... Uh, one or two man auger. I've got to think you're talking about, you know, like a toe behind or uh, so we're not talking about mini skids. We're not talking about skid loaders is what it sounds like. So prior to us having mini skids and prior to us having uh, skid steers or any of the rest of that, uh, we used uh, little beavers. So they're a, technically they can be a toe behind auger. We didn't tow. We did tow them once. And the thing about a little beaver is when you put it behind a work truck and the gentleman driving the truck doesn't remember it's back there, then he goes, he can't see it in his mirrors and he goes to back up. He backs up over the auger. We towed it once and then we had to fix it. And then we never towed it again. So the thing about the little beaver is you can put it in the back of a truck. You can put it on a trailer. They're fairly light. Uh, it can be a one man. We use, we use two guys on one because if it hits a rock, it's still going to buck and rock quite a lot. Uh, and two men make it easier to load back onto the truck or trailer. Um, Little Beaver is the one we used. There's a lot of them out there. And this is another subject where if you ask 10 fence guys this same question, you would probably get five or six different answers. And you would for sure get two answers that said the other answers were absolutely lunacy and that they were horrible fence people, et cetera, and onward. But my answer is the Little Beaver. We've used it. I like it. Now, it doesn't have the torque and it. Obviously, doesn't have the down pressure than a than a mini excavator or a, a mini loader would, um, but mini loaders are expensive. I get it. You know, a, a new a new mini skid is thirty five forty thousand dollars, and that's it's a big chunk of change, even for an established fence company. That's a very serious amount of money. So, Little Beaver, we've used them. I like them. It's probably not the only one, but that's my answer. All right, so. Oh, awesome. Uh, so Roger says the little beavers are actually uh, made not very far from him. Great machines. Good to know. So, uh, yeah, we've used them. I like them. Do not tow them behind your truck because you might run over them. And when I say might, we definitely have. All right. So we've got two up on our board and all they say is screenshot. So we've got a Brad screenshot and a JB screenshot. And Jeremy probably has these for me. All right. Oh, I can see why. This is a very long one. 
All right. So I'll just get, I won't pre-read it because it's really long. I'll just read it as we go here. Uh, Brad Op says, how would you build a fence alongside your neighbor's fence? I have 200 feet of shared fence line on the right and 50 feet on the left. The existing fence on the right is the neighbor's and ready to fall over. And it's not, and it, and it's less than six feet tall. Working with them is not an option. I'll talk about that in a second. The guy on the left put up a standard picket fence, but did it wrong. On the pickets, he put one screw on the top and bottom stringer, nothing in the middle. That's confusing, right? So you put one in the top and one in the bottom. Why do you have a middle stringer? I don't know. Okay. Um, it's starting to twist and warp already. Plus, I want to use postmaster posts all the way around. 510 feet total. Holy cow. That is a yard. That is a substantial yard. Well, I mean, maybe not in Brad's neck of the world, but uh, here in the Midwest, I mean, 200 feet is probably the norm. 200 to 250 feet, pretty normal. So about twice the uh, backyard. How would you do it? Thanks, Magoo. Is that how you pronounce that, Jeremy? M-A-G-O-O? -O? Magoo. So it's not Brad Op. It's actually Magoo. So, okay. Nicknames. Here we go. All right. So a couple of things there. So how do you put an existing fence against, or a new fence against an existing fence? And so basically the, well, maybe not the only way. The best way, the way we do it is you would face, if we're talking about installing a six, so he's talking about postmasters. So we're talking about a privacy fence or maybe a shadow box fence. Shadow box fence, you're probably not going to be able to install it against a, a neighbor's. I'm sure someone on here will tell me I'm wrong and explain to me how you can install it. Fine. I don't, there's not a great way of installing a shadow box fence against a fence. All right. Privacy fence. So you just face the finish side in towards you. If that's the only option is that you fence up against this. So, and this is going to get tricky without like a, a drawing board, right? So when we're looking at a postmaster post, it looks like a top hat. I think that's probably the best way to explain it. The, the top part of the top hat, so not the brim, but the top part, typically faces the finish side. And so you would face that part of the top hat in towards you. So now screwing the two by fours on there would get a little bit trickier. You can always flip them around. They can go either way. The finish side of the fence is in towards you. That way you have access to the two by fours. You have access to the pickets. You can put that fence flush as long as it's on your property. Now. Sometimes people install fences inside their property line by a large margin. Here in Missouri, we, we step in six inches. It works for us. That way the finish side, no part of the fence, the finish side or otherwise, encroaches on the neighbor's property. Other states might be more or less. Other countries might be different. In Missouri, in the United States, six inches. Some, some people will step their fence in from that, their property line by two feet. So we need to establish property lines first. But Let's assume that the property that the fence is installed on the property line or just inside, then you would you could abut your fence to theirs. You could butt it right up to their fence, finish side in towards you. You to access your two before's and pickets. Um, that's how I do it. You guys following along? If you do it differently, let me know. Uh, I mean, listen, we're all here to learn too, right? So. When I say Joe Everest, the fence expert, I don't say Joe Everest, the guy that has all the answers ever to fencing. Because that's not going to happen. Because we're all learning. We should all be learning. The minute you stop learning is the minute you start falling behind. So uh, I, I learn things on a daily basis from your guys' feedback and your guys' comments. You know, it, whether it's in the video, on our Facebook page, wherever. Um, yeah. So, but that's how I do it. Finish side in. You can butt it up to the fence. Um, yeah. So, all right. So, we're caught up in the chat. So, let's talk about another part of that. What he asked is... Uh, what he said something about the neighbor is just not willing to work with him or the fence is falling down and, and the neighbor working with neighbors, not an option. So the three things to keep a fence company in business, my granddad said this for years and I absolutely think it's true that three things that keep a fence company in business is kids, pets, and neighbors, bad neighbors, unsightly neighbors, neighbor dispute. Neighbors is a big one. We've all, if you're a fence contractor and you've built any fence at all, you have been on a project that had neighbors. 
whether it's a battery line dispute, which is more common than you would think, or uh, you know neighbors that don't keep their yard in in the way that the customer thinks they should, or they keep more things outside than the customer thinks they should, or whatever. Kids, pets. My granddad used to say, "Kids, pets, and bad neighbors." I just shortened that down to kids, pets, and neighbors. Sometimes, I, actually, I don't know that anybody puts up a fence for good neighbors. I don't think, but. There is a saying that we do remind you guys that good fences make good neighbors. So maybe if it's a bad neighbor situation and when we build a fence, maybe it helps turn them into good neighbors. Probably not, but you never know. All right. So I saw the chat scrolling through here. Let's see. Um, okay. Austin's got a great question. Uh, in a lot of contracting industries, a 50% gross profit margin is ideal. It's fencing the same. I ask because fencing is very material heavy. A hundred percent, Austin. It is absolutely material heavy. Uh, so no, 50% gross profit. You don't see that much at all. Uh, I mean, you can, right? I mean, you could price your product wherever you'd like, uh, but not typically. You know, typically, uh, so we, we follow the profit first system, which is simply you have multiple bank accounts for different aspects of your business. And one of those is OPEX. So for us, OPEX is uh, material. It's uh, it's basically all your operating expenditures, but it doesn't include payroll. Payroll is a separate uh, bank account. Anyway, so on and so forth. Uh, if you guys are contractors, you should absolutely follow that. Short caveat there. Contra uh, profit first for contractors is, is a must read. There's an audio book. I don't, I'm not a book guy. I like learning, but I can't sit and read books, but I can listen to audio books. There's an audio book for it. Um, but no, so our OPEX is, I had to go back and look, it's either 56 or 59%, which means, and that's before we do payroll. So um, I understand also OPEX, so it's also our, um, our oper all of our operating expense. So overhead is in there. Uh, profit is not in there. Uh, so the buckets, income. So income is all revenue that comes into the business. And then that splits into uh, OPEX. Owner's compensation, uh, payroll, and profit. So OPEX is basically anything that doesn't fit in those. It's not the uh, owner's compensation. It's not you know the what we pay the owner for owning and taking the risk and liability of owning this business. It's not the profit that is attributed to the business itself because if a business isn't making profit, what is it doing? And then it's also not payroll. Uh, 50, 60, 59%. So no, 50% uh, gross profit. Now, is it achievable? Sure. But when you look, I think if you look nationwide, coast to coast, I don't think you see that in a lot. Now, in a lot of those fence, com co fence companies, there we go. Now, I am in some contractors groups, um, mainly uh, font Contractor Fight Club and the 100K group. Uh, Tom Reber and some guys have a, have a really good set of groups there. Uh, and they really push for 50%, which is absolutely desirable. Like You want to get as close to 50% gross profit as you can because it makes your business sustainable. Guys, we've been in a great economy for years and years. We haven't we haven't faced adversity like our parents and our grandparents have. I I haven't been alive during a a huge negative economic event. So we need to prepare ourselves for that. Though uh, we need to strive towards fifty percent gross profit because it makes our businesses more sustainable. It lets us build fence next year. And the next year and the next year. So I've got a little son. He's three, just turned three. And I want him to be a fence guy. Part of me does. The other part of me doesn't want him to be a fence guy because I know what it's like being a kid in a fence company. I've, I've been that kid. So you always want better for your kids, right? So part of me does, part of me doesn't. But, but if he's going to be a fence guy, if he's going to come into my fence business and there's going to be a business there for him to come into, it has to be sustainable. So while 50% is not common, it should absolutely be the goal. That's a very long answer to your question. And I apologize, Austin. All right. James Miller. Hey, Joe, love watching your videos. I have a small fence company I started after serving in the Army. I have had it for 13 years. Congratulations, James. And thank you for your service. Uh, 13 years. So most, most fence companies that fail, fail in the first three to five years. Uh, typically because, and this probably relates to the, to the gross profit, um, 
because they don't know where their gross profit is, they're making not enough money to sustain themselves. So they flame out in three or five years. But James has been in for 13. So he's gotten over that hump. Um, James, why don't you tell us where are you from? What area are you from? And, uh, yeah, we'll talk about that for a little bit. But so congratulations, James. I hope I've helped you. Uh, if you have any questions, I love when fence guys ask me direct questions because it helps me be more helpful to other people. Helps me answer those questions. All right. So, all right. James is in Amarillo, Texas. What is up with Texas people? We have a lot of tech, nothing wrong with Texas people. Will, Roger, I get it. Texas people are cool. But a lot of Texas people here. All right. That's a thing. Um, Eric Fountain, I'm building a privacy fence right now. And a few of my holes aren't quite 24 inches due to rock. What depth would you feel comfortable with? Okay. I'm just outside Mountain Home, Arkansas, by the way. So great clarification there. So the first thing we talk about is frost depth. What is your frost depth? Now being in Arkansas, so you're under, so it says not quite 24. How do you, Eric, how deep is that hole? So you say it aren't quite 24 inches. Some guys might say that 16 inches is not quite 24. And those are two very different things. Um, so, so why don't you, why don't you type in the comments if you're close to 24 inches. So say you're 22 inches, which is close to 24. You're below the frost depth. I'm assuming you're concreting these posts in. If it's a really rocky soil, if there's a lot of substance to this soil, I think you'd be fine at 20 to 22 inches, as long as that's not every post. So if we're making an exception or two exceptions on the entire fence, I'm okay with 20 to 22 inches concreted in really rocky soil. Uh, because so rocky soil, really rocky soil is going to hold that post a lot more firmly, a lot longer than you know, a loose you know, a, a loose dirt or a loose soil, uh, which down in Arkansas, you guys have the same, same soil we have here in Missouri. It's largely chunk rock. I mean, not really boulders. Sometimes you see them around the lakes, but uh, yeah. So most are 24, but a few are about 20, 22. Okay. I'm fine with that. As long as it's a few, as long as they're not really close to each other. Um, 20, 22 inches is fine. It, like it sounds like you're in rocky soil. I think that's okay. 24 inches is, is the standard. But as long as they're not, as long as they're not too many, as long as they're not next to each other, I think it's, I think you'd be fine at 20, 22 inches. Um, I could be wrong here, but in my area, I'm happy with getting 18 inches. So yeah, so down in Texas, you guys aren't going to have a frost depth, right? Or in the Northern part of Texas, maybe, but where you guys are, you don't have a frost depth, but you do have a minimum structural load, right? So 18 inches, honestly, it's probably going to be towards the shallow side of where I feel comfortable. But, James, you've been building fences for 13 years, too. So you've been around long enough to see the fences that failed due to shallow post depth. Um, if 16 inches is a depth that you're comfortable with and that, you know, you guys get quite a lot of wind load down in Texas, as long as it's enough to hold the wind load, then I'm sure, I'm sure it's okay. 24 inches is absolutely the standard we strive towards, but we don't all live in a perfect world where we can get 24 inches. I understand that. Eric says it's definitely rocky. So yeah. So here in, here in the Midwest, it's, we get a lot of chunk rock and um, it's not fun. I'd rather have solid rock. If I'm, if I'm, if I have to choose, if I had to choose, I'd go build fence in like Iowa where I, they don't have rocks. If you, they just don't. I don't know what it is about the state of Iowa, but they don't have rocks. It seems like I would love to live there. But if I had to have rocks, I would I would choose large chunk rock only because you can core drill directly into it. You don't have to worry about it. Chunk rock, you can't. You, you obviously there's not enough there to drill into, and you got to get each one, each and every one of them out of the hole before it drigs any further. Chunk rock is a pain. All right. So, but James does say that he uses eighty pounds of quick read to post. So that's quite a bit quite a bit of concrete i mean 80 pounds is a standard bag of concrete so it sounds like it'd hold pretty well uh jeremy are you trying to get my attention does the video still look good on your end yeah okay. all right so Durf boy 06 we do 24 all around columbus ohio any issues pulling out the jackhammer any issues pull out the jackhammer yeah so i don't I think Ohio probably has less rocks than other states do too. I could be wrong, but 
I talked to guys in Ohio that build fence in Ohio. Hmm. Not so much rocks. I would love to be there. But if it was easy, everybody would do it, right? So, I mean, you guys have your own issues. Everyone has their own list of issues. If it's not rock, it's wind. If it's not wind, it's rain. If it's not rain, you know, on and on and on, right? So our particular bane of our existence is chunky rock, and it really is not great. All right, so Austin says, love your videos. Thank you, Austin. I really appreciate that. You guys are why I'm here. Right. You guys asking your questions is why I'm here to answer questions. I love being helpful. And you guys help me discover the questions I need to answer. Um, OK. Yeah. So Durf Boy. So follow up on the Ohio. My comment about rocks. He says it depends if it's a new development. So anytime you get into backfill dirt, that's probably the worst dirt to build a fence in because it's all of the construction, you know, rock that they found when they're digging the foundations or the basement. And it's all the construction debris that ends up on that job lot gets buried under the final grade. And then we get to dig through it. Never, never a great time. Um, James Miller. Okay. Yeah. So it's usually 18 to 20 inches with a six inch auger bit, uh, a lot of concrete, but I like it. Yeah. So 80, 80 pounds is pretty much the standard of concrete. Um, yeah, sometimes we'll use 90. So quick set concrete comes in 45 pound bags here. So we'll sometimes if we have to, we'll use two bags and so 90 pounds. Not a lot of fun. But yeah, a bag of quick creed is pretty standard per post. All right. So I think we're caught up. Let me scroll real quick. Yeah, I think we're caught up, guys. If you've asked a question that I haven't gotten to, put like some asterisks next to it, put it in again. I'll watch for that. But I think we're pretty well caught up. Um, all right. Oh, so does Chubby Chubs have a follow-up? You have that written up on the board. Did I miss that? Let me scroll back. Yeah. That's it, Roger's coming with a little few or before. Oh, follow-up question. Um, can I hammer in the Master Halco with the pneumatic hammer and drive them into the ground or go ahead and dig a hole? Yeah, so there's a lot of guys that do drive the postmaster post. Um, there are specific uh, heads for you know say a rhino driver you know any sort of pneumatic driver uh, well or it can be a gas driver for that matter uh, there are heads specific for uh, postmaster posts um the one for rhino i think is called the municipal head driver and so they're made for driving sign posts right and um, but they work on the master halco post as well the thing with driving the post is you're going to want to drive a longer post so instead of so instead of using a seven foot six inch or an eight foot post master post and setting them in the concrete, you want to use a ten foot post and drive it hopefully four foot in the ground, three and a half to four feet. That way, that thing is embedded in the ground. Um, yeah, you can absolutely drive them. You just need a little bit longer post. Sorry, ticks along with the follow up there. I'm I'll try to do a better job. Chubby Chubs, I hope you're still here. All right, so. Oh, man, Jimbo. So what is your favorite electric gate opener brand? Are you trying to start a fight in these chats? Every fence guy has their brand. And this is one of those things that... All right, so the main brands it, are what? So like Chamberlain, um, Door King, Elite, uh, Viking. Mm, those are probably the... There's others. Those are probably the more um, quality brands. Um, I prefer Viking. I like Viking gate operators. They work out of the box. A lot of them work out of the box. Viking works out of the box. A lot of their boards are interchangeable operator to operator. So they don't have a one model specific board. Uh, typically, you know, if you have, if you have a, a slide gate board, it's pretty much good throughout the slide gates. If you have a swing gate board, it's pretty much good throughout the swing gates. And some of those in the older models were interchangeable from swing gates to slide gates. Um, I learned on Vikings. I installed Vikings. I like the Viking brand. That's not to say that Liftmaster is any better or worse. That's not to say Elite. It's not to say I get it, guys. My brand, if you're asking me, you steal from too. So there's going to be some weight there. Uh, we like using the Shark Hinge, uh, Forney Fence. Uh, actually, for all you Texas guys, Forney Fence is out of Texas as well. Uh, we like using their Shark Hinge and Shark Latch. It bolts directly onto the round steel post for you fence guys. It bolts up a lot like a 180 degree hinge where it just, it's a U bolt bolts directly to that uh, round post. And then it has a hinge welded onto it that then bolts into your steel wood frame or your steel frame for your wood gate. Uh, so it's a steel to steel to steel contact. 
a lot of I see fence contractors that are using steel frames and steel posts, but they'll still use the wood hinges that just bolts onto that wooden two by four uh, on the outside of the gate. I think one guy's opinion, I think that defeats the purpose because now we're relying on that lag bolt to hold the weight of the gate and it's into a wood product. Lag bolt can over time work its way loose. The wood over time can can release its hold on that on that lag bolt. I think you're relying a lot on a wood product there. But anyway, if we're doing if it's a big gate, we'll use more concrete. And if you can get it, we'll go a little bit deeper. But I understand sometimes you can't get it. Um, more is better because no callbacks is better than any callback. Is better than one callback. So if you can spend a little bit more time up front and save yourself a callback later. It'll absolutely be worth it in the long term. Um, all right. Okay, so Austin Garland has a question. Here's a big question I've been wondering. On Western Red Cedar pickets, do you prefer the 5 eighths thick picket or the 3 quarter picket? So, I mean, obviously, preference is 3 quarter. I mean, the thicker, the better, because they're going to hold your shape a little bit better. But pricing comes into play there, too. So if that three quarter inch picket is random numbers, twice the cost of, you know, a five eighths picket, then the five eighths picket is going to be where we're at. See, the, all these used to be called a one inch nominal, and a lot of a lot of mills still call these a one inch picket. You know, one by six by six it is usually not one inch. It's usually not five and a half. It's typically six foot tall, uh, but typically the one inch nominal pickets are going to be closer to five eighths to three quarter, and and the rough sawn cedar is typically going to vary anyway. So I don't, I don't really, a lot of guys will split hairs between five eighths and three quarters on rough sawn cedar. I think you're going to see a little of both in a pallet. So even if you get three quarter inch, I think you're probably going to find a few pickets in there that are going to be less than three quarter inch. Uh, maybe not, maybe I'm wrong on that, but I think it's, I think on rough sawn cedar, you rarely ever see one size picket. So three quarters is probably going to be preferable as long as the price justifies it but a lot of times with these thicker pickets you see companies that really increase the price uh, beyond what seems to make sense so um all right eric's in northern arkansas okay so we're getting closer to home we're getting closer to home nothing wrong with texas but arkansas is closer to missouri do we have any missouri folks here do we have anyone else here from missouri because i would we got these texas and arkansas guys and ohio guys we don't have any missouri yet or gals to be fair We'll say people in general. Well, I mean, Missouri people. So if you're in Missouri, comment and I'll give you a shout out because, you know, I like Missouri people because I'm from Missouri. All right. Um, all right. Chubby Chubs is still here. Okay, good. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad I got to answer your question while you're still here. I apologize for the delay. Um, yeah. All right. Chubby, thank you. Thank you for joining the chat, guys. I mean, we've been here for a while and, and I appreciate you guys sticking with me. Um, all right, Eric, 10 minutes from Missouri. Okay, so you're close, right? You're 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 close to Missouri. Still in Arkansas. Nothing wrong with Arkansas, but not technically Missouri. All right. So all right. So all right. So we've been we've been at this for an hour and 15 minutes. If you guys have last minute questions, why don't you answer, answer them below? Uh, oh, we still have a screenshot from JB. Is that right? I'll let I'll let Jeremy cue that up real quick. Um, so we've got one more screenshot. So let me answer a question, and I'm sure it's nobody here because the reading the comments in some of these videos can be tricky, right? You, you, some of this you have to take with a with a grain of salt. Grain of salt, grain of sand. Grain of salt. Yeah, take it with grain of salt. Um, probably number one comment I get is uh, calling calling my shirts prison attire. Now, I've not been to prison. I've not visited prison. I don't know that prisoners wear button-up collared shirts. Maybe they do. I think what they're talking about is that it's orange. Why do I wear orange everything? You know, when I say orange everything, I do mean orange everything. Our trucks, and it's because it's a company thing, right? So our fence company, our company color is orange. Everything we do is orange. Our trucks are wrapped orange. Regardless of what color that truck was in its former life, it is now orange. Final wrapped, it's Ozark fence, it's orange. Our guys wear orange. We all wear orange. I've got, actually, I forgot to take this off before the live broadcast. Our 
the city of Springfield requires face coverings. This is not me making a statement. This is me simply following Springfield, you know, city rules. Jeremy and I are six feet apart, so I don't have to wear this right now. But our face coverings are orange. Our hats are orange. In the wintertime, we've got, what do you call, cotton hats? I don't know if you call them that. Stocking caps is the word. So we have orange stocking caps. We have orange everything. And that's because it makes us visible, right? So this started when we we're on a construction project, a large construction project. I had a lot of people on it, a lot of moving parts. And I wanted to easily identifiable who, who was with, who was our people and who were other people. And I wanted the site superintendent to be able to see, because on this particular project, there were issues with some, some workers not following the rules, putting trash where trash shouldn't be, et cetera, and onward. And I, and that kind of galvanized it for me that I want our people to be easily identifiable. I want people to be able to look at whoever it is that's causing a ruckus or putting trash where it doesn't go and automatically know that they're, that they're not our people because they're not in bright orange and they don't say Ozark fence. So all of what we do is bright orange. Now our trucks are orange too, because Hey, it grabs attention. It lets people know. And it's a safety thing. You can see one of our trucks coming from a large distance away. And, and it's kind of a, it's kind of a culture thing too, right? Everything we do is orange. So people start knowing us as the guys in orange and it's, why do I wear orange? Am I, I'm not typically on job sites all day, every day, but I wear orange because my people wear orange and we're all a team, right? We're all on team Ozark fence. And so we all wear orange and that's, that's why I wear, wear that's why I wear orange shirts. Now here's a funny thought and let me, let me know what Jimbo Jimbo put up a pumpkin. <laughs> Jimbo, come on. Anyway, I like orange. Everything we do is orange. We've gotten to the point. Let me tell a quick story real quick. So you might have to, re, so you might have to refresh that screen real quick. I, JB, I will get to your screenshot, I promise. But let me tell you a funny story. And I am not allowed to decorate our house ever again, period. Because I like the color orange now. Orange has become like part of me. So my wife made it very clear that I wasn't allowed to decorate anything inside because she knows that it will be orange. But when we bought this house, it had a tree in the front yard. And that tree was, it was a, the, it was a builder special tree. Who knows what kind of tree it was? It was a dead tree. That tree died. We needed a new tree because our HOA covenants, I'm not a big HOA fan, but our HOA covenants said, you have to have a tree in the front yard of a certain size and type. So I said, okay. So I called a landscaper I knew and I said, hey, I need a tree this size, this, you know, this style or whatever you call trees, this version of tree. And he goes, well, what color do you want the tree? Um, Trees are green, as far as I know, right? Give me a green one. Really pretty. He's like, no, no, no. In the fall, what color do you want that tree to turn? Now, this friend of mine knows me well. And I said, well, how about an orange one? Like, really orange one. So, <laughs> so he gets me this tree. Now, when we buy this house, it's spring, right? So the tree's green. In the summertime, the tree's green. And then comes fall. So... Uh, like, let's say late September. We're getting close to fall. So it's fall. It's a little cooler. And every time I drive home, turn around the corner, I look down the street. Nope. Tree's still green. Next day, turn around the corner. Nope. Tree's still green until one glorious day. And it happened like that. One glorious day, I turned the corner and that tree <laughs> is blaze orange. And my wife was furious <laughs> because now we have a blaze orange tree in front of our house and she's not impressed. Anyway, very long story to say, I'm not allowed to decorate anything in my house ever again, period, without express permission because everything I do is orange. All right. JB says, I uh, prefer board on board, pre stained pickets, Western Cedars, six foot privacy fence. Where's the best place to go for pre stained wood? Uh, only seven foot, six inch postmaster post. So we, we talked about pre stained wood, right? We talked about that, but the follow up here it is. So the reason we're talking about it only seven foot, six inch postmaster post sold at big box stores in my area. Frost lines 12 inches is 18 inch post holes deep enough. Uh, space between houses very is very tight. Six foot setback. Oh, it's pretty, it's very tight. Okay. So should I come in three inches from property line to account for board on board? And top cap, good side will be facing the neighbor things. Okay, so let me do this. So there's some we got some fence guys. We got some fence guys in the comments or that are watching us right now. Fence guys, what do you think the reason is for seven foot six inch postmaster post? 
comment it here. I'll I'll talk about the rest of this, but I want you guys to let me know what you think. Seven foot six inch postmaster. All right. So the next question was, uh, so he has a, a tight lot line. So six foot setback means the foundation of that that house is only six foot from the property line. So there's not a lot of room to move. Should I come three inches? Should I come in three inches from the property line to account for board on board? This is where I preface this by saying I am not a lawyer. I do not, you know, practice law. This is in no way legal advice at all. I think you should be closer to six inches. That way, no part of your fence even comes close to encroaching on the property line. The problem is, according to the lawyers, that I am not one, that if that fence is on the property line or can be construed as being on the property line, it becomes mutual property between you and the person you share that property line with. Uh, so they get to have a say in how you treat the fence, what you do with the fence, if the fence is repaired, et cetera, and onward. So six inches is, is our typical setback. I get where they're going with this. Three inches accounts for, so we talked about this, the inch and a half of the two before, two inches if you've got it. And then he's doing board on board to so stacked pickets. So call it another inch, inch and a half in pickets. I would step in six inches. I understand that the lot lines are tight, but uh, six inches is definitely going to be the step back. All right. No one commented with a seven foot at six inches. All right. So here's why it's seven foot, six inch. Now we use eight foot postmasters because it gives us flexibility, but seven foot, six inch postmasters is because typically your top stringer on a fence is six inches below the top. Seems to be a standard. It's what we use is what the guys I talk to, what they follow. Some people are more, some people are less. Six inches seems to be the standard. So instead of an eight foot post, six foot out of the ground, you do a seven foot, six inch post because that top stringer is going to be seven foot, six is going to be five foot, six inches above the ground. Uh, so you could set those posts to height and not have to cut them. My issue with this is at least in our, in our neck of the country, you get a lot of differing terrains. You get a lot of slope, a lot of gradual, you know, rises and falls. I like to use an eight foot post. So they're full six inches out of the ground. And then we cut off four to six inches off of every post so that we can account for that slope so that we can build the slope into the fence. And we're not constricted, you know, to only as, only having five foot, six, five foot, six inches out of the ground. But JB, if you're in an area that is nice and flat and you want to set your post to height, seven foot, six inches is going to be fine. You'll set them a full two foot deep and it'll set your post exactly to height. You want to cut it off. So, all right. Um, Oh yeah, Jimbo picked up on the orange ring. Thank you. I, I'm telling you, everything is orange. I don't know. One second. Phone case orange. Uh, what else do we have? Everything's orange. I'm, I'm just telling you, people, my friends, if they're buying me gifts, they buy me orange things. People find orange stuff and they bring it to my office and drop it off because they know we love orange stuff. If a promotional company is wanting to sell us something to put our name on to give to our customers. It's always orange because they know like we got to think for the color. So uh, Roger, I won't be operating anywhere near you. Orange is going to be my color as well. Also my wife's least favorite color. Oh, well, yeah, that's, it might not be a good decorating color, but it is a good marketing color because it jumps out at you. You know, if, if we're talking about now, it also, it also means that the safety vest we wear when, when required by OSHA regulations uh, we'll match whatever else we have. We'll match our hats and match our trucks. Uh, the other color you have available is like the lime green color. And I'm not such a fan of the lime green color. I don't know. Orange is a great color. But according to my wife and, and apparently your wife, Roger, is not a great decorating color. Except for like one month a year. Like one season. Like it's perfect for autumn, I think. So our fall, our fall family pictures, my wife's one like little thing she gives on our fall pictures our fall family pictures usually incorporate an orange or i think this year is going to be a burnt orange i've been told um so yeah one little concession we get is uh, in the autumn orange is a good color for that so all right um guys so we've been at this an hour and a half almost hour and 25 minutes uh let's do a last call for questions so if you guys have a have a question or a comment something you'd like uh, me to answer Go ahead and drop it in the comments below. I know I know there's going to be a delay here, so I'll give it give it just a little bit, and we'll go. All right, so Matthew actually just popped up with a question. Uh, when building a fence on a slope, what is the process? What's the process? I'm a first-timer. I'm on my way around tools, uh, so that's not a problem. Um, 
building a fence on a slope was a process. So we're actually going to have a whole video on this. Here's, and, and I'll try to, so we've got a video where I tried to explain it on a whiteboard. The feedback I got was that maybe it wasn't as clear as it should have been. So uh, start with the video maybe, but so there's two, there's two trains of thought. One is that you stair step it. So your fence will come down and then fall, come over, fall, come over, fall, stair stepping. I'm not a big fan of that. I like contour. And so what we'll do is we'll set our post, as I said, a little bit higher. So we'll set it a full six. If you're building a six foot privacy fence, a full six foot out of the ground. And then we will run a string line at five foot, six inches from every post. So now we know exactly where our top stringer would be if it follows that ground exactly. And you step back and you look at that line. Now, a lot of times here in the Midwest, it's going to do this. All right. So now we're raising some of the lines. We're lowering some of the lines to try to take the craziness out of it to try to keep it more on steady slope. If it's, if it's one big slope, same story, right? Five foot, six inches all the way down the post with a string line and then step back and take a look at it and see if that matches what you think, if that looks pleasing to the eye. If not, you can adjust on each post that string to get it exactly how you want it. Uh, now that might, that might mean cutting some pickets. So your next step is you would mark all your posts at that, at whatever that string line is at, wherever you decided that looks great. Uh, and that's where your top stringer is going to go. Your pickets go six inches above the stringer. And as long as you do that, you're in pretty good shape now. So you're not a fence guy, but you're handy with tools, which means, so probably there's some specific tools that make setting the picket high a lot easier. You know, there's jigs you use to set the six inches off. So you're just tapping pickets on the way I've seen done without you know specific tools is set a picket nail one nail on a picket at each post so every eight feet at the six inches and then you can run a string line from the top of one picket to the top of the next picket and nail that away where each picket touches that string it should fall in line um one way to do it without specific tools you know there's a there is a website it's called mr fence tools they sell they sell a tool specifically for setting the top line of the fence. Uh, I think it's a great tool. We use a version of it. Um, but yeah, string line works just as well. I hope I answered that okay-ish. Uh, like I said, we did a video on it where I tried to explain it uh, a little bit better. We will be doing a video you know, later this year, upcoming, uh, where I do that on site, uh, hopefully to give a little bit better perspective on setting the height for a slope. Um, Durf Boy asks, any used dingoes for sale? Not that I've seen. Um, used dingoes go very quickly if if they're well taken care of and if they're you know if they run well and they're a decent piece of equipment, you rarely ever see them because typically guys buy them and use them till they just fall apart. So the ones you see for sale are typically for sale for you know for a parts dingo. Um, you rarely ever see good used ones for sale. If you do find a good used one, buy it quick. Uh, but take it to a small engine mechanic, have them go through it before you buy it, just to make sure there's nothing, you know, crazy that may have been covered up. Uh, you want, you want to see it because like I said, hardly anyone sells one for, you know, for good reason. Typically you'll hold on to them till they absolutely fall apart. Uh, Austin asks, what do you think about using subcontractors instead of employees for fencing projects? Great question, Austin. We use both for depending on the type of project. For residential projects, typically they're typically they're in house or employees, um, because our com our customers feel most comfortable with that arrangement. They like knowing that they work directly for the company, that they're covered by our work compensation or workman's compensation insurance, um, that sort of thing. Be because there's a negative connotation for whatever reason with subcontractors, and maybe in certain markets it's it's justly you know it's just, but in our market. This, the guys, the, the subcontract guys that build fence are great guys. They build great fence. So there's, I don't have any issue. I mean, we use uh, subcontract crews, teams on commercial projects because the commercial owners typically don't mind one way or the other. I mean, they're going to hold my company, you know, responsible for this fence regardless of who installs it. So they don't mind whether they're in house or con subcontract. But in the in the residential market, homeowners typically prefer. Uh, in, in home or in house or, you know, employees to work on their project. 
Uh, you know, if you're dealing with a con company that uses subcontractors, I wouldn't necessarily view that as a negative. You do want to make sure everyone has their insurance. So typically the subcontractor will be required to hold and maintain their own workman's compensation policy. So, I mean, it's a good question to ask. If you're having a fence built, ask, you know, do you use your own laborers or do you use subcontract labor? And if so, you'd want to see a copy or, you know, ideally be listed as additional insured on their workman's compensation. It's, it doesn't cost any more. It's a simple phone call to have you added as additional insured and have a certificate of insurance sent to you. Uh, just saying that the insurance is in place. And if something happens on your pro on your property that they'll be covered under that insurance. Um, but I, to answer your question, I have no qualms one way or the other on in-house because here's the thing I've seen, I've seen fences installed by companies that use in-house labor. They use employees that, got replaced fairly quickly. You know, it wasn't installed right at all. I've seen fences installed by subcontractors that probably are the same way. Uh, but and, and the and the flip side's true. I've seen fences installed by subcontractors that are great. I mean they're they're high quality fences because these guys are professional for the most part. And like I said, this very well could vary market to market. But in our market, as if we're talking about quality of fence built, I think it's the same one way or the other. All right. Um, all right. So Austin found us through, uh, through Tom Reaver's channel. So contractor sales Academy. So it's, it's probably actually contractors fight. Well, maybe through CSA. Um, so contractor sales Academy is a group uh, that Tom's in with a few other guys and they deal mo more with uh, the sales side of uh, contracting and construction. Um, I'll give these guys a plug. Understand, first and foremost, full transparency, I don't get paid anything to refer these guys, um, but I am a part of the program. I pay full price to be in the be, to be in the programs. I absolutely believe in them. Uh, Tom Reber runs the 100K group. Uh, he also has a free group, the uh, Contractor Fight. Uh, there's also the Contractor Sales Academy that is ran uh, by Tom Reber uh, uh, and a group of other guys, uh, Steve Schindler's one, you know, a group of guys uh, that focus on... Uh, bringing your sales game up and, and sales, I don't want to use sales as a negative term here, you know, consulting, right. To, to get people away from salesmen, salesy type and be actually be a value to the customer to bring value to the customer through more consulting than anything. Anyway, huge believer in those groups. Austin, I'm glad that you're here through them. Um, All right. So it sounds like everyone's pretty much got their questions answered. Um, guys, thank you. I mean, you guys have been here for quite a while. We've been at this an hour and a half uh, for our first one. Like, I think this is a pretty resounding success. You know, I, I appreciate you. I appreciate you guys um, tuning in. Final question from me to you. Is this something? So we've talked about how often to do live videos, live Q and A's. I really enjoy this. I love that you guys enjoy this because now we, we both get value out of this. If this were to be, so the thought now is, is this a, is this a weekly occurrence? Is it a monthly occurrence? I would like it to be a, to be a weekly occurrence to set up one day a week where we turn on the live equipment and I sit here in front of the mic and answer any questions you guys might have. Um, but the other thought there is maybe that's a bit much, you know, maybe, maybe monthly is more on par. Uh, what do you guys think? If you, I'll, I'll wait a few minutes because I know, or a few seconds or whatever. I know there's a delay. Um, but what do you think? If this were a weekly occurrence, is this something that you would find value in? Now, I'm not asking for a head count on who would be here every week, but I'm saying, is this something you could see being valuable? Um, one thought I have on the weekly is that, you know, some folks are available some weeks, not other weeks. You know, everyone lives a life, right? Everyone's busy. So I think being weekly would give more people the opportunity to tune in and ask questions. Um, but I could also see the flip side where, you know, that might seem like a bit much if we're doing it every week to other people. So what do you guys think? Okay. Yeah, that's fair. Math, Matthew says uh, probably monthly. All right. Jeremy, while we're waiting for these to come in, you got anything else? Any questions, concerns, otherwise? Okay. Great, great, okay. great feedback. So. Yeah, yeah, great questions, guys. I this is absolutely how I dreamed of this going is having nice dialogue back and forth. I mean, me being able to answer questions that honestly I hadn't thought of prior to us going live. 
So thank you guys. Um, yeah, Roger says I would like weekly. Probably won't make all of them. No, no, and that's understand. That's not what I'm asking. I'm not saying all right. Who will be here every week? And I will call roll. No, what I'm just saying is I'm just trying to get feedback from you guys on what you think is would be most beneficial. Um, like I said, I, I I really feel like weekly could do well only because you know some folks will be available some weeks and not other weeks. And if it were monthly and you know life came up and they weren't able to make it, then the next one would be a month away. Um, you know, in these groups that I'm in, a lot of the a lot of the calls or a lot of the chats, the video conferences are weekly. Uh, I like that because I can't make all of them. I'm just, I put it on my calendar. I absolutely intend to. And then life has a really big laugh and chuckles and I'm off to do something else. Uh, but I like that they're weekly so that I can tune in as I'm available, you know, not have, not feel like I'm waiting a whole month before I get to watch another one. Um, try. Okay. Yep. Will make sense. You should, you should try another one in the evening and see what the turnout is. I'm sure a lot of your fans at work and stuff. Yeah. So that makes sense too. You know, so this one obviously started at 10 30 AM central. Uh, you know, maybe the next one we try in the evening. Um, yeah. So I'll just, I'll let uh, my wife know that will said that we should do one in the evening. So that way she doesn't get mad at me and which she's never met. Will. she has no will. So I'll just let her be mad at will for a while and just say, you know, I'm, Babe, I'm, I, we usually do these in the day, but Wilson's doing the evening. I think it's a good idea. I really do. I think you're right. And, that you know, there's a lot of guys, contractors specifically, that are really busy during the day and uh, probably wouldn't be able to make a daytime, but maybe be able to make a, uh, an evening an evening live chat. Uh, let's see. So is there a way of sharing pictures of how we do things in Britain comparing? I think that's really interesting. So – yeah, so I have two thoughts on that. One, there's a community, there's a community page in our community tab and our YouTube page. Uh, you could absolutely post it there. We watch that. My next thought is on our Facebook page. So as I said in the beginning, the in the beginning, which is an hour and a half ago. So we have a YouTube page that is Facebook.com or FB.com now forward slash the real Joe Everest, uh, where we're we've got kind of another community page going there. Uh, either one of those is completely fine. Uh, can YouTube community, can you post pictures and videos on there? Can someone that is not our page? Okay. Yeah, I, I think so. But I just want, I want to double check. Yeah. So either the YouTube community page here on the, on the Joe Everest YouTube channel or uh, FB.com, Facebook.com forward slash the real Joe Everest. One of those, we watch both of them. Uh, post it there. I think that's a great idea, guys, is that maybe we continue the dialogue from here onto one of those community pages where, you know, pictures, videos, if not, if not on the YouTube, I know you can on the, I know you can on the Facebook, uh, Facebook page. Um, yeah, post them up. I'd love to see how you guys are doing it because guys, so that's something that's absolutely blown my mind is that is a decent part of our viewership is outside the United States, which it shouldn't blow my mind. I get it. But I'm a fence guy in Missouri and this YouTube channel, when we start looking at who watches the videos, I mean, there's a, there's a significant portion of our viewers in Europe. Um, and then we, we also have some Asia, South America, Australia, New Zealand. Um, but yeah, quite a few in Europe. So welcome guys. And we should probably, I don't know, we should probably take that into account when we're talking, when we're thinking about the live broadcast too. Um, so many time zones to think about. So many. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. Answer your question. Send us a picture, a video. I like to see how you guys do things. Now, understand. Let's talk about this. For my fence company contractor folks, we are all in groups, I'm sure, together, specific to fencing, where pictures are not uh, constructively reviewed. I don't think there's any place to tear somebody down for the work they do in some case. Okay. Some cases I think it's justified to have constructive criticism, but some of the stuff I see on these pages is absolutely unwarranted. You know, somebody, somebody put time and effort into building this fence, you know, and a lot guys are just starting out, spent a significant time on this fence because they don't have the equipment to do it efficiently. So any sort of, Criticism that is not constructive has no place in any of these pages. 
And and I'll tell you, you know, right now it's not going to happen on our pages. If someone posts a picture or video or a comment or anything, absolutely. Anything I say is absolutely open to constructive criticism. I welcome it because it's how we get better. Um, but we won't, we won't, you know, I'm not going to have nasty comments. I'm not going to have criticism that is not constructive. And I'll leave it at that. Um, the, so, yeah, whether it's directed to me or otherwise. Um, yeah, any criticism that's not constructive won't be tolerated. And we'll leave it at that. All right. So, <laughs> uh, Will says he'll, he'll take the blame. So, Will's on the hook for the evening lives uh, with the wife, um, which is pretty pretty safe because they're several states away and she doesn't. She's never met Will, so that's probably a good idea. All right. So, let's see. Um, Zebra says, yo, Joe, real quick. What's the best way to deal with tree roots? There's so if they're small enough tree roots, you could certainly cut through them. And I say that tentatively because I know, I know there are people that will hold exception to me saying you can cut a tree root. I know it. Okay. Let's move past that. You cut it. Or you move the post. If you can, you move the post, right? Because if you find one route, you'll find two, you'll find a dozen. So you move the post if you can, but you can't move every post. Sometimes posts have to go where they go. And so you cut them however you can. You know, with a reciprocating saw, uh, Sawzall is a brand. We used a wall, but with a reciprocating saw, um, you know, some, some sort of saw to get through it. Some guys use chainsaws. Eh, and dirt. I don't know if that's a great idea, but whatever. Cut them, cut through them, and if if you can't move it, you cut it. So, um, all right. So, oh, okay, yeah. So Matthew Matthew clarified that he was saying monthly because he was thinking about my time. Thank you, Matthew. I appreciate that. Um, yeah. So I, I like the thought of weekly. I really do. I yeah. We'll we'll discuss evenings. Uh, if we should try evening, we should try an evening just to see, knowing that it will not be as well received at home. But that's okay. Um, we'll just make extra time at home during the day, one day a week, and we'll equal that out. So, all right. Um, Alan just finished work. So, uh, so I'm trying to keep track of who's who here. Alan M is Alan M. So I think he, did you say you're in Britain? Am I getting that right? Let me go back through here. Alan M. Yeah, yeah Britain. Okay, I got that right. So you just finished work. Congratulations on finishing your day. We're only about halfway through ours here, which is, yeah. So congratulations on finishing your day. So, but that makes me wonder though. So Alan's done with his day here, but if we did this, you know, so, you know, God, it's already noon here. Um, if we did this six hours later, that would be overnight in Britain. So maybe Alan wouldn't get, but there's always a recording, right? So uh, we're going to post this on the YouTube channel. It'll be viewable um, for a while, forever, really, as long as YouTube's around. Um, yeah. So maybe, maybe we play with that. Maybe, or maybe we make some match. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe two a month are during the day and two are during the evening or I don't know. We'll just, we'll have to see. What that's the answer is we're just gonna have to see. Um Matthew's on to something here. Maybe you need to take a field trip to Europe. So um I'm gonna tell my wife that Matthew says we need to go to Europe and because I'm on board with that completely, and we'll just uh blame it on Matthew because she's never met Matthew either. So we'll just say, yeah, maybe he said we gotta go, we gotta go. I'd love to visit Europe, like on a wholly unrelated fence note. I would love to visit Europe in general. I think it would be great to see the history. Jeremy, you've been to Europe, haven't you? Did you take a trip out there? No. Yeah, so Jeremy, lucky dog. He's already been there. <laughs> I want to go. I really do. Uh, I think it would be I think it would be neat to see the history. I mean, obviously, in the United States, we have history, but not on the scale that Europe does, um, and Asia, for that matter. I think it would be neat. I think it would be neat also to meet with guys that build fence uh, in – other parts of the country and other parts of the world just to see, because like I said, guys, if we, the day we stop learning is the day we fall behind. So if we can learn something from uh, the fencers across the pond, as they say, someone says that I'm sure. Um, and I think we could all be better for it. So 
Maybe maybe a Joe the Fig says expert goes to Europe edition. I don't never know. Stranger things have probably happened. All right. So Yeah. All right, yeah. So Alan says happy happy catching the end and then and then the recording. Absolutely. So like I said, I think we'll pl probably play with this. I think we'll try I mean obviously a daytime live was a success. I've used this as a resounding success. Uh, so maybe we'll try another one. The next one's in the evening and then talk about mixing and matching and see where we go from there. But for the time being, guys, thank you. I appreciate you guys staying with me. I appreciate you guys interacting back and forth. I mean, that makes this enjoyable. And like I say, it helps it helps take my blinders off to, to questions, concerns, issues that you guys are seeing that I'm not seeing. And, you know, we kind of try to tackle them together. So thank you. I appreciate you guys, uh, like I say, sticking with us about hour and 45 minutes, which is considerably longer than I thought it would go. But it, I've had so much fun that it uh, it seemed like a breeze. So anyway, guys, thank you. I appreciate you. And uh, we'll see you next time.